morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, afternoon, no, it's not an afternoon express. It's a morning express talk into the future, the future of cybersecurity. I will be your captain for this ride. And if you are seated, I request that you put on your safety belts because it's going to be a fast ride. Uh, as a reminder, this is a non-smoking flight, absolutely non-smoking. If you do find yourself in the need to smoke, and this is Vegas, I know it is for some weird reason allowed here. Uh, back home where I come from in the Mediterranean, uh, we don't really allow that sort of thing because we're really sticklers for rules. But here in Vegas, they let you smoke anywhere, but not in this room. Okay, guys and girls, we got that down? Good. Fantastic. And uh, if the live stream is ready, I'm also ready to really start the talk. I do have a couple more stickers. I'll be asking some questions during the talk. So those of you brave enough to put your hand up there and try and get, get the right answer, that's great. If not, I still have the stickers for you later on. Klaus, can I ask you for a favor? Can you grab that? Can you grab this? Put them down. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. Welcome, people on the interwebs to B-Sides Las Vegas, I am the cavalry track. My name is Karen el -Azari, and what I would like to do uh, with your time that you have graciously given me this morning, I wanna give you some of my ideas of why hackers are the real heroes in this world, and why hackers are my own personal private heroes as well. Now, I'd like to congratulate you for showing up today because you have answered my call I called out all the hacker heroes and I said, okay, you guys and girls are ready to take the next step, to go above and beyond with your work, with your security research work, with your vulnerability disclosure, with the policy work that you're doing. And what I'd like to do today, this morning, is give you some practical ideas and advice on how I think, from my humble point of view, how I think you could do even more with your knowledge and your ideas. Sounds good? You ready to roll? Everybody seated? Okay, let's do this. So, First off, you're here because you already made the most difficult choice. You took the red pill. You realized it's up to us. There ain't no other heroes out there. We are the people that are gonna save the day. We are the cavalry, as they say here. So, well done. But now the real work begins. You've made the choice to be a hero. You've made the choice to dedicate your life and your career to security work. That is awesome. Uh, that's a choice I made about 20 years ago. And here's what it takes to be a, a hero, in my personal opinion. You know, you can be all kinds of heroes, by the way. Uh, this is one of my personal heroes. That's Trinity from The Matrix. Uh, one of my favorite scenes, uh, for those of you who re remember the movie, is when Trinity first meets Neo in a nightclub. And do you remember what happened? What, would, what did Neo think about Trinity when he first met her? Yes, he thought she was a dude. Uh, well, that happens. I am not a dude. I have always not been a dude. Uh, I have much respect for people who are dudes or undudes. Everybody is cool as long as it's safe, sane, and consensual and to adults or more. However, heroes do come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And guess what? Sometimes we are the heroes, but people think we're the bad guys. Does that happen to you? It happens to me all the time. When I go on a a plane to go somewhere and I open up my laptop with all my stickers, I can see the flight attendants get nervous. When I uh, you know, go to get my hair done and then they ask me, so what do you do for a living? And I was like, yeah, I'm a hacker. They're like, you're a hacker and you just say it like that? Shouldn't you keep it a secret? Isn't that criminal? Aren't you doing wrong stuff? And what I do with everybody that asks me is that I say I'm proud to call myself a hacker. And you know what else? It is way too hot to wear hoodies in Tel Aviv, where I come from <laughs> anyway. All right? Just trust me on that one. But, you know, some of us are kind of like day job hackers, right? Like Clark Kent. In the morning, we're all cool and suits. Then in the evening, we're Superman. Or at least that's kind of the narrative uh, that people expect. Maybe people watching Mr. Robot and shows like that. They want hackers to have that split personality. You know, be the good guy and then you know, separate their lives and their personal choices from that. Um, I think being a hero is a little bit more complex than that, than that, actually. And it's not a cookie cutter thing, right? It's not just be the one thing, be that Clark Kent or that Superman with the straight uh, laced morals and ethics and that's it and that's the way it goes. Has anyone here seen the Batman versus Superman uh, latest movie? I think uh, that's a movie that really brings to light that conflict. I'm a big comic book fan. 
Uh, FYI, also, in the latest Batman Super Moon, Superman movie, uh, there is a fantastic lady uh, playing Wonder Woman. Did you all know she is Israeli? Yes, Gal Gadot, she's one of us. Israeli women represent, y'all, all right. But this is, you know, if I had to choose my favorite comic book, hero slash anti-hero slash villain maybe sometimes, it would be Deadpool. And you know what, even Deadpool comes in all shapes and sizes, like me and my friends here at the Deadpool premiere in Tel Aviv a couple months back. So we got uh, Lady Deadpool, we got Catpool, that's me, by the way. Um, we got like regular, you know, double pistol Deadpool, and we got like Fanpool. He's also cool. So there's like various levels and types of heroes that you can be. You don't have to be like, you know, like Bo and Josh, you know, quit everything you're doing, move to DC, join a nonprofit, you know, do all that stuff. There's lots of different things that you can do right now, actually, and we're gonna talk about this stuff. But I want you to know that being a hero isn't like a you know, drop everything else that you're doing sort of gig. It's more like a Deadpool sort of thing. You get it? You with me? You all seen the Deadpool movie? Yes. yes. How many times? <laughs> Just the ones? Six? Good. Very nice, very nice. Guys, at least three if you want to get all the jokes and the stuff. Right? Like if you're serious. All right. But seriously, this is my real, actual hero. This is Angelina Jolie. In 95, when I was 14, and I can see you guys doing the math. I know it's complicated. Don't sweat it, I'm 35 now. Uh, so when I saw this movie in 95, I was 14, I realized that it was my calling to be a hacker hero, just like Acid Burn in the most epic film ever made, Hackers, from 95. And I've seen that movie maybe like 1,337 times, approximately. Uh, but here's the thing, here's why that movie meant so much to me. This is who I was uh, back then, when I discovered that there's this thing called being a hacker and you can be the hero. So that's an actual yearbook photo. Uh, I, I'm in the photo, it's not one of those trick questions. I did show up for school that day. Uh, how many of you have already heard me speak somewhere else and have already seen this picture? You, I know you. Hi, hi. Okay, so those of you who have already seen uh, this picture of me are excluded from the following competition. Also, friends and family uh, cannot participate this time. Uh, but for the rest of you, have fun trying to find me in the picture. I guess a bunch of you are already trying to get it. Anyone got it? There is a prize, yeah? Is this you in the lower right corner here? Looking this, this, this girl? No, that's not me. Uh, Going twice? Over here, this one, this one, this one. Okay, no, going third, last chance. On the bottom row, two inches to the right. Here, this, this. Okay, no. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, all bets are off, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are prepared for the truth, the honest truth, it hurts. That's me, yep. <laughs> Take it all in, the nerdness uh, is there, and you know, I wouldn't go anywhere without my state-of-the-art 93 Sony Walkman, even the yearbook photo, and I was so much of a nerd that even the guys playing D&D, &D, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, FYI, uh, decided I'm too much of a geek to join their crew. <laughs> yep, but I found a better crew. Yep, the Deadpool crew. Only took me 20 years, but I finally made it. Anyway, that's who I was and this is who I wanted to be. Uh, you know, 20 years later, fast forward, I'm pretty happy with how my life turned out. Uh, speaking at DEF CON a couple of years ago, 2014, was a real dream come true for me personally. Um, if you haven't been to DEF CON yet, you have to go. If you haven't submitted a talk to speak at uh, B-Sides or DEF CON, do it, it will be the ride of your life. Uh, I also had another dream come true that same year. Maybe some of you have seen or heard about it, uh, in 2014, I was invited to be the first Israeli woman to speak at the International TED Conference. That's the, like the big TED, like the Bill Gates is sitting in front of me kind of TED. And I freaked out, uh, obviously, but I think the talk went very well and my idea that hackers are the heroes or the immune system uh, for the information age really kind of became viral, if you don't mind the biology pun. Okay, stand up, I'm not gonna do it. Moving on, so 
uh, this talk went viral. Lots of people have seen it, have responded to me, but I have to uh, confess, I have a confession to make. I got something wrong in the talk, which is very embarrassing when like two million people have seen it. So in the original script, what I was supposed to say, what I was going to say, was that, that hackers are the immune system for the information age, not just for the internet, right? Because we all know the internet is just like one part of what we all do. That's not everything. The internet does not include, you know, I don't know, laser shooting autonomous robots, for example. Not yet anyway, uh, but we'll get there. But the TED folks just, you know, caught me saying the internet and that's it, you know, it lives on for posterity. But here's the thing, we do really need that immune system for our entire world, in fact, for our universe. This is the internet, or rather the World Wide Web, about 10 years ago. And that's kind of a visualization of, you know, websites or servers that you could discover on the internet. That's not the only place that we need to defend as heroes. If I wanted to show you what our current world looks like, it would be like the Milky Way, right? It's a galaxy, and just like our universe, it keeps expanding. It becomes bigger and bigger, and there are dark corners to it. Dark corners that the world does not want to know about or protect or even visit. But we are the pioneers. We are the explorers in this universe because we go there first, right? We go to the dark web first and we go to, uh, we use Shodan to identify devices and hardware that is discoverable on the interwebs before everybody else knows about it. So guess what? We, are in, like, we have a huge responsibility as the pioneers of this place Maybe even the natives, if you're with me on the analogy there. I know there's been a lot of analogies this morning. So maybe less analogies, more funny stuff. Well, here's a funny thing. In this universe, we have our villains. Every good hero needs a good villain. And here's what I think the villains are. I don't think the villains of cybersecurity are government agencies, or cyber criminals in the Ukraine or you know, somewhere like that. Pardon my friends from the Ukraine. I think the real villains that we have to fight are bugs, software and hardware vulnerabilities. And guess what? As our universe keeps expanding, there are gonna be more and more bugs. And they're not like alien bugs, they're you know, software and hardware bugs. And they're in stuff that we didn't even think about, stuff that is just now getting connected to other stuff whether it's GSM or radio frequency stuff, or you know, a freaking laser shooting autonomous robot on Mars uh, that just happens to be running uh, one of the most vulnerable and most popular software and computing environment in the galaxy. Any guesses what that popular software and computing environment in the galaxy is? Uh, by the way, it's not Klingon. Somebody tried that? It's not? Any guesses? Windows XP. Uh, thank you, Patrick. It is not Windows XP. It is Java. It is Java, uh, Java, uh, Java runtime, JavaScript, all that stuff. And guess what? Even the Mars Curiosity rover has Java in its operating system. And a hardened, embedded operating system as opposed to this, you know, live out there in space for decades. So that's a scary concept right there, isn't it? And guess what? We are just creating more and more code. As humans write more code, even if we let AIs or bots or machines or algorithms write our code, we're gonna go from the you know, 100,000 count of you know, like 100,000 lines of code for an iPhone app, uh, maybe a couple more for a game design engine like Quake, but we're quickly jumping into the 50 million lines of code, 100 million lines of code for stuff like cars. So it would be naive to not expect the bugs to already be there. And it would be even more naive and perhaps even childish of us, of us to expect the companies that make this code or the governments that are supposed to regulate all of these different new fields of, of industry that have never before thought about cybersecurity. You know, the automotive people or the medical device people or the uh, aviation people, you know, the, the airlines, they're just kind of waking up to something we've known for a while. So it's gonna take them even longer while to adjust. While they figure their, you know, frack out we need to be there, we need to step up, we need to be the cavalry. How can we do that? Well, one thing I think uh, which could help us do that is be really vigilant for these sort of like super villains, right? These are like the super mega bugs like Heartbleed and Bash Shellshock. Bugs that are in stuff that everybody uses and have been 
in the wild for like months and years. And nobody knew about them and nobody fixed them because nobody cared and nobody bothered to look. So that would be the area I would encourage you to focus your energies, your research, and also your protection uh, efforts in your organization. I would ask, where is our third party software coming from? And you know what, it's, it's a puzzle, right? When you get a piece of software for somebody, if you're a company that's buying a product, I find it hilarious that right now I could have like a candy bar, I could buy a candy bar or a kind bar, and it would say all of the things in it. It's got nuts, and it's got chocolate, and it's got cherries, and I'd know exactly what's in it. But if I'm a multi-billion company that's buying another multi-billion company's code and software and technology, I don't really even know what all of the third-party software libraries are in it. Don't you think that's a little bit silly? How are we going to keep track of all of this vulnerable software? Well, one idea which I'm excited about, and I think you'll learn more about uh, later today, is the idea of software bill of materials. So a list of ingredients for what's in the software. And guess what? This is an area where you can be the heroes in your place of work. Let's say you make decisions about buying technology. Can you ask the vendor, what's in this software actually? If you're a consumer, how many of you guys use Facebook? I guess a bunch of you use Facebook. I recently decided to maybe not use Facebook as much. I made a personal choice based on some security analysis I did. Uh, and one thing I did was look at the app on my phone and try and figure out what was the third party software that that app was using. And I found a bunch of stuff that I did not enjoy finding. So take a minute to think about the stuff that we just accept blindly and willingly as a product, like a black box. Would you eat like a candy bar that was in a black wrapper and you had no idea what's in it? Would you put that in your body? Well, some of us are more adventurous, I guess. You'd put all kinds of stuff in your bodies, and that's cool too, no judging. Uh, however, when it comes to software that could hurt or you know, influence human lives, that's where you need to make a difference with your choices, I think. And you can make a stand as a consumer, as a private individual, as a corporate. Uh, but guess what? We leave it to governments. We leave it to the regulators to figure this out. They are going to fail. Not because they're not good or because they don't want to fix this. Because it's, they're just slower to adapt because they're not natives to this world. And we are. So why should we be looking for bugs and doing this sort of security research work? Not just for fame fun and fortune, although all of these can be found in the security professional's life. Not just adventure and excitement, no. For the future. Do it for the kids. <laughs> I know it sounds like a joke, but I'm actually serious. I don't have kids yet. I'd like to have some soon. I'd like them to grow up in a world with technology they can trust, technology that I can let them trust, because I am a techno-optimist in my nature. But it's not just going to happen by itself. It's not, a, you know, it's not like gravity. Security and privacy are efforts that take work and time and thinking. They don't just happen by themselves. And bugs are going to be there. So one thing I've been asking myself recently a lot is, what's the impact of bug bounty programs? I'm sure you all heard about bug bounty programs. Yeah, you've heard about them. If you haven't, they're great. Uh, I think they're great ways for companies to collaborate with hackers. But I know a lot of people are questioning, you know, there's so many bug bounty programs out there these days. And thanks to Bug Crowd for creating this great uh, evolution or timeline of the history of bug bounties in the past 20 years. They've really come very far. Now you can find a bug bounty program to report errors in popular sites like YouPorn, Yahoo, and United Airlines, just to name a few big brands. And I think that's pretty cool, actually. Um, however, I've been really asking the question, what is the value of these programs? And one thing I know people are discussing for researchers, why should they give up their vulnerability that they found or their time or their effort to help a company? Maybe they get like a gift card, like a $100 gift card or a $1,000 gift card. You can't make a living from that. You can't make a six-figure salary from that. Uh, well, that's right. No, you can't. However, that's not the point. Bug bounty programs are not there to help you get rich fast. They are there to get more people to find more bugs faster. So it's about scale and scope and size. It's about, it's about getting the thousands of you know, independent, friendly hackers out there in the world to have an easy way to find problems in code. And uh, I did a little research into some of the data coming from programs like the Google program, which is very big, uh, the Facebook program, the Microsoft program. I interviewed some individual people running programs and participating in some. And this was all done as part of my work at Tel Aviv University. I'm a researcher there. 
And one thing I discovered, which was very surprising to me, is that bug bounties are great for finding more bugs faster. Yes, we all know that. That's kind of intuitive. Uh, well, they also create awareness and reputation and media attention because now, you know, United Airlines wants to talk to people about their bug bounty program because they want the positive PR that's a part of that. I'm okay with them. I'm okay with United getting some positive PR points if it's because they have a bug bounty program. And let me tell you why. My mom was an airline manager for 20 years. I can now come up to my mom and say, hey, you know United, this huge airline? Did you know the website has bugs, but hackers are actually helping fix those bugs and they get some miles in return? And my mom would be, okay, I'm cool with that. That's pretty awesome. So that's why it's cool to have bug bounty programs, even if people can't make six-figure salaries out of them, or you know, huge DEF CON, blockbuster, 4,000 people talks about moving planes from side to side, that's okay. If they're getting bugs fixed, that's cool. I'm cool with it. But the last thing which really surprised me was that these bug bounty programs around the world are creating a new workforce. So let me give you a practical example. This is from the Google uh, data for their bug bounty program in 2014. And what this map shows is where the researchers are coming from. And what Google has said uh, is that most of them are not from North America, as you might expect, but actually Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, Africa, uh, even uh, down here in Australia. So it's a global thing, and especially in some places like Africa, Asia, and Latin America, some of the researchers reporting for these bugs, these are people getting legitimately paid on the up and up for security research work in the first times in their lives. So it has already created an alternative to the dark side, in a sense. Yes, maybe they're not making six-figure salaries of, of their zero-day vulnerabilities, but they are joining our workforce. They're getting their first steps. Who here uh, started the first steps in the industry um, five years ago? How many of you have been in the industry more than five years? Ten, five, five, okay. Uh, keep your hand in the air if you've been more than 10 years. Hand in the air if you've been here more than 20 years, 20 years security industry. Yeah, you guys, 20 years in, that's me. We're the desert generation. Desert generation is a concept from the Jewish Bible. I won't get into it, but the fact is 20th century is gone, and now it's a new era, and we need all the help we can get. So we need more people in this industry, and bug bounty programs are one way to get people in, which is why I'm a fan. And you know, Cisco says we need one million people more in this industry. That's their data. Uh, they did a pretty decent study on the workforce. Million is a lot of people. This is a room of 40 or 50. So we're gonna need these programs to help get more people on board. And the programs also help build the bridges. So what do I mean by bridges? Some places where there was once a firewall, there is now a collaboration opportunity. Case in point, the Pentagon, right? The US DOD, one of probably the most conservative bastions of old school power, opening up wide to work with hackers. I guess that sounds like really romantic and naive, uh, but it's actually creating some cool impact in the real world. And it's showing other organizations, other nation states, other countries, other agencies, that there is potential here. Because if the Pentagon is doing it, well maybe you know, the government of Israel can do it, maybe. United Airlines, we spoke about that, their million mile uh, reward for vulnerability discovery. Yeah, so maybe they only did it because of this guy and they wanted to spin the story. I don't know why United decided all of a sudden to have a bug bounty program. But I don't care. I'm happy there is one, right? And I'm happy that this guy did his research and spoke up about it in the way that he did. In fact, uh, for those of you not familiar with Sea Dragon 1, that's the tweet heard around the world where last year he got on a plane on his way to B-Sides in San Francisco and was tweeting some of this stuff up uh, and it created a whole viral mess. Unpleasant for him, unpleasant for United. In the end though, one year later, maybe some difference in the world. Maybe, that's my point of view anyway. Uh, so these programs for hackers and companies to talk to each other are creating an alternative to the dark side, if you will, I think. So here's another tweet I saw recently. I don't know who this guy is, by the way. If you know him, tell him I say hi. Uh, he's a guy who found a zero day and the vendor ignored him. So he decided to create an exploit in the hope that now they do not ignore him. That's his choice to make, and I understand where he's coming from. However, guess that vendor could have done things differently by not ignoring this guy. So if you are working for a vendor, don't ignore hackers. Really simple. You know, just do the basics. Respond. 
Uh, there is no better disinfectant than the light of day. Right? That's so powerful, it's worth saying it again. There is no better disinfectant than the light of day. We need to get more research work done faster and out there in the world in every way we can. So something I'm extremely excited about and I tried out personally is this totally new project that you can all join the beta. It's free and it's up for download right now. It's called Zero Patch. Zero like the number O. And Zero Patch is a new technology by a bunch of hackers from Slovenia uh, who got tired of their pen testing work being so easy. So they would always use vulnerabilities that were already in the wild and had known exploits for them. What these guys created was a tool for micro patching software without the vendor's consent, approval, or no know-how, but that's cool. They're not interfering with the vendor software. So let me give you a practical example once again. I try this out. Let's say I'm running Foxit. Uh, do you know Foxit, the popular PDF reader, alternative to uh, Acrobat? Also has a bunch of zero days or you know, vulnerabilities, maybe not zero days. Well-known, well-documented, in the wild vulnerabilities. The guys at Zero Patch created a micro patch that you run in your machine and it prevents this exploit from running. In a, I tried it out with a weaponized PDF and this is the, I got this uh, message that it blocked it. And this is done without any knowledge cooperation or authorization by Foxit. But they didn't do it in the darkness. They blogged about it, they talked to them about it, they let them know they're doing it. Because they can get these micro patches done much faster than Foxit can get their attention to fixing their vulnerable code. If you're interested in that, I suggest you take, you know, give it a try. Maybe create a micro patch yourself. So perhaps the, ne the next generation of bug bounty programs will be patch bounty programs. People creating micro patches for vulnerable software and fixing it. Hey, what's up? You want a sticker? Yep. Okay, then stay quiet till the end of the talk. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That's how we do it in Israel, guys. All right. My heroes. If you want to read more about my ideas, this stuff, I recently posted an op-ed on motherboard.vice.com. Uh, you can read more about this stuff. I know I have to wrap up pretty soon. I have a couple more minutes, or are we done? No, no more minutes? Okay, you ate into all of my time, Josh. I will eat all of your raspberry pies. <laughs> so, uh, just, uh, you know, just to rec recognize this guy and the work that he did, Barnaby Jack, a true inspiration to many of us here in the room, I think. A researcher that pushed the envelope in what he did with medical device stuff. Jay Radcliffe, a member of I Am The Cavalry. Is he here? Yes. Where is he? No, okay, well. Uh, I say hi. Jay Radcliffe, awesome guy. Uh, this is Dr. Mary Mo. She has a pacemaker in her body and she is a professor of information security. And she did a TEDx talk on hacking her own pacemaker. I recently had the pleasure, uh, thanks to I Am The Cavalry, and thanks to Bo, thank you very much, of hosting Mary at B-Sides TLV, which is in my hometown. It was just last month and I got B-Sides crew right there. Represent y'all, woo! Yeah, don't leave me hanging, thank you. Uh, so a bunch of our speakers are here. Ezra, my co-host, is there. Uh, if you want more B-Side Selvi stickers, I got them. Uh, save the dates. So these were the dates for last time. It's in June in Israel. So uh, uh, the, the big conference that we're uh, a satellite to is called Cyber Week. It's organized by Tel Aviv University. And guess what? It's all free. So come out to Tel Aviv. Weather is guaranteed to be sunny or your money back. <laughs> Did I mention it's free? And I'm the Cavalry. Thank you so much, guys. We all are in this together. I had a bunch of other stuff that I want to talk to you about, but I won't take into uh, other people's time anymore. I see Jack, though. Jack, oh, 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 he ran away. <laughs> you know, he's like one of those mythical unicorns. <laughs> well, if somebody sees Jack, let him know I have a gift for him. Uh, you have to demonstrate a threat to spark a solution. That's what Barnaby Jack said. I tried to do that in my line of work in an ethical, responsible, and moral way. Uh, it's really up to each and every one of us to decide what kind of a hero we want to be. But the call for the hero is...